Gary Mansky is an expert in special effects and miniature cin cinematography. His work covers the entire spectrum of film, including features, commercials, documentaries, and music videos, and he has worked for any... That was me, sorry. Sometimes that happens. Um, Only to professionals. Is there anything they don't have here? This is an incident light meter. See the little thing that measures the light falling on that? At the same time, this thing, hello, this thing turns it into a spot meter. So you can look through and get the light falling on something over there. Thank you, Ross. Um, uh, Gary has worked for tons and tons of clients, including McDonald's, Ford, Chevrolet, Tanner Made Golf, um, Sony, Budweiser, American Airlines, Honda, tons and tons of clients. Uh, he's won a Clio for special effects, he's won two Eddies for best cinematography, and an Emmy for best, uh, uh, Emmy for best cinematography. Uh, Gary Mansky, come on in. Um, you've heard my background. Uh, let me just sit down here. I normally work in the dark. I normally don't talk about my work. Um, it's nice to be invited to this event. I hope that, uh, yeah, so, um, hopefully, is it working? Yeah. Um, Hopefully what I tell you, or what you can get from today in a short amount of time, is useful. Um, it is a little different what I do. You know, I've done everything, I've been, it, yeah, I've been fortunate enough in my career because I started when I was, uh, really got on session when I was 16. And uh, I moved into full DP at 27. And I lived in Hollywood. So I had a lot of really good opportunities, which is essential to uh, probably everybody's career. You can be the greatest guy in the world, but if you get an opportunity, if somebody loves you, and <laughs> gives that, passes it on to you, <coughs> you're not gonna be going anywhere. But anyway, um, what you see today is I sell product. And Mark Mezinoff, who around here somewhere, we have a unique history. Um, I came down to San Diego in 1995 because I was working for Mattel and I was shooting all my work in Canada. And I owned a house out in Point Loma that I had to bring out. And anyway, um, are these two mics too close together maybe? Is that what's going on? Maybe this, this chest mic and the one that's on my ear? They're two, two different things. Okay, so no worries. Um, so, um, anyway, so I moved down here because I just need to be near an airport and I was kind of, since I wasn't really working in LA, all my business was up in Canada because of the exchange rate. Um, I just decided to come down here and go back. Anyway, so back in the day, you had to produce, to get jobs, I had to, you have to put out a reel, that's how you get work. And uh, in those days, the reel was three quarter inch cassettes, which are these massive, archaic, you know, there's a gerbil inside there that you gotta feed, and it's, it's really technical. But anyway, um, and so in San Diego, unlike LA, where I can go to a 7-Eleven and get my three quarter inch cassettes made, mm -hmm. I couldn't find somebody in San Diego. And I'm talking to people, talking to people, and somebody said, oh, this is a company called Multi-Image, and they have a three-quarter inch machine. And I'm going, ah, okay. So I call up, and I happen to get Mark on the phone, and I tell him, I said, I'm a director, I do toy commercials, I have to get uh, some reels sent out, I gotta do it now, right? And it's like, he goes, oh yeah, come on over. So I put up my toy reel, and he goes, oh, he goes, have you ever done anything like golf? And because that was one of their clients, Taylor they made golf. And I said, no. And he said, would you be interested? And they said, yeah, sure. And so they hired me to just do product because all their product, frankly, looked like shit. <laughs> and pretty bluntly, it was like, dude, you're not selling product. You're photographing product. There's a big difference. So um, each product, we were just talking in the case of reflective, hard light, uh, glass, liquid, you know, jewelry. Everything is lit differently. It's pretty hard for me to give you some general lighting. What I will tell you is um, trust your instinct. 
when you, I had some good advice years ago uh, from uh, when I was still assisting with a British DP, and he said, when you get done lighting, you're set. And I don't care if it's this set, that set, because that set is a critical set all in itself, is that when you get done lighting and you go, man, I've, I've created the greatest piece of work ever, start turning lights off. And he goes, you will discover things that probably will change your attitude on that. You'll start to realize it's like jazz. Less is more. It's an important lesson I never forgot. I really think that that is advice that every uh, camera person should really do. They should start looking at it and say, you know, this, this, this. Maybe it doesn't need that. Maybe it needs to be really just essence. And it might be that whole thing in backlight, period. It might just be the edge. It might be dramatic. I might be doing liquid light, you know, or I'm like peeling the light off with a, with a card or something. There's all kinds of other things that, um, that you want to, as a cameraman, explore. And so, uh, you know, I, what I did is I gave these guys a little quick uh, example of some of my work, which is kind of the spectrum of sort of what I do. And some of it's in the black world, some of it's in the white world, some of it's toys, some of it's this. And you kind of get an idea that every one of those things are not all that. This is for this. So I don't know if that's queued up, if we want to look at that real quick. And, oh, sure. <laughs> Mike, do you want to sound? Yeah, turn the Stress test, stress test. <laughs> <coughs> okay, bye. Don't worry about it. First time.
wants to. So it won't come to me, but it'll come to Mattel or anybody else I'm working for. Um, so that is, man, easy. Oh, yeah, put some nice LEDs in there and crank them. We're good to go. No, not so fast. If you want handcuffs on the way out. So, you know, and food, same thing. Anything that, if you're selling anything on that plate that is, if it's the meat, let's say, everything else can be fake. People will probably do that, but everything else can be fake. But that piece of bologna has to be the real thing. Ice cream has to be the real thing. If it's one, something in the background, dessert, it can be made out of styrofoam. Piece of dry ice that looks fantastic to the camera. Uh, but that's a new thing. But anyway, back to this. Um, what we kind of want to just show you is <coughs> most of the stuff that um, you see in front of you, I either hand built or it's just proprietary in a lot of ways. Um, these sliders, these are all my sliders that I build. Um, there's been multiple generations. I, the first one I built was probably 25 years ago. Um, there. One of the things, the reason why you use it is for a variety of reasons. I can work in multiple multitude of dimensions because obviously it can spin. You can spin it during the shot. I usually don't do that because um, what I'm, another thing that I'm always fighting is I'm fighting any kind of shake. I try not to be on the camera, on the dolly, no one touching it, things like that, because when I'm that close to it, everything is just magnified. Um, the turntable, this is a, a manual turntable. People say, well, why do you use a manual turntable? Well, because we control it. We can start, we can stop it. It doesn't have the, depending on the motor, like a motor that's, you know, that just turns something, that looks fine. But now when I'm looking at it that close, now I got a problem. You can see these little things shake into it. So a lot of what we do is designed to like, it's like dealing with the lighting that's inside the product. If that's the case, it's fighting those other things. It's really nothing to do with photography. It's just like, can't touch the camera. How do you operate? Can't touch the camera. A little tricky. Um, we have a, uh, this is a nodal head. It's a 3D nodal head, 360 degree nodal head. And what it does, which is critical to, what I do is, if you can see, that here's the main axis. That's what it rotates on, and it runs directly right down the lens. That's important because if you saw on there, a lot of that stuff people go, oh, it's like three, it's, 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 you know, it's CG. Well, it's not, it's not CG, but what it allows me to do is while we're moving or dollying, I can rotate this thing, and I can sail to it, so I'm like flying through the product. And it stays on note. If it wasn't a note, all of a sudden it just got out of frame. And then I have to correct. Um, it's, very, it's a special one. There was a guy in Hollywood who originally made this thing. We were talking, and it was, he had it in a rental house, and I rented it all the time. I take it to Canada all the time. And it's like, I just said, you know, hey, make me one. And which, like, I get asked for people to say, make me one of your tracks. And it's like, it's a lot of work. It's a lot, it's a mind boggling amount of work to get it right. And, like, and he goes, nah, I'm not, I don't want to make one of this stuff. And I said, why don't you make rental cars? And he's going, oh, it goes out a couple times a month. I'm going, well, I know that I rent a week. Of course, week rentals is like, depending on the rental house, it might only keep like two days of rent. It's always like seven days. And, you know, dude, you make a hundred bucks a week. Sell it to me. You know, retire. <laughs> so I, that's all I know. So this is the only one that I've ever seen, the only one I've ever known. There are other noble heads. Most of them flop. This is, I can run it upside down. And one of the advantages to upside down cables, make sure I don't pinch this camera is that in the case of clubs like this, this gets back to your um, your client. Did you see how the club heads down, the shaft's going up? That, you know, like, well, who cares? But your um, client, like golf people, they have a thing. I'm not, I'm not a golfer. I have own clubs, I'm a golfer. When you work with golfers, they're amazing. So they're very particular. It's a cult. I'm sure there's some people in here that are golfers. And so when they get a club, to them it's important, is when they hold that club in their hand, it's what they see. They want to see that perspective. So when that, that shaft always has to be up. They don't want to see it upside down. Well, you 
can see my rig. I mean, I could do this whole thing the other way. A huge pain in the ass, so. But the camera. It just allows me to work in that environment. Now, yeah, you can do it in post, you can do this thing. Well, sometimes I got mirroring, I got all kinds of things. It's just easier for me <coughs> to work upside down. Um, once again, obviously, so I can slide through it. I can turn through it. You know, we can come into it, you know, and like come out of frame. And I can. You know, little star was on my cables. But I can see, like, right now, like, there's like dust that's settled down. And so, those things, that's one of those things where people go, like, especially, especially producers, they go, how long is it going to take? And I go, I can't answer that for you, Brian. I can, I can, I can lie to you, you know, because I'd be really guessing. Because, once again, if this was plastic, all of a sudden it's going to have static. It's a war zone, you know? And it's like, if there's dust in it, doesn't, look how, doesn't matter how good it looks, you're, you didn't fulfill the problem. So, you know, I can come through stuff like that. And it, it's just a whole nother, that stuff. See that reflected light? See that come across the bottom? You know, it adds a whole nother dramatic piece to the to the uh, shot, and it's that magic. It's that moment that people go, "Okay, that's what I'm paying for. That's what I want." Um, but like I said, this is simple. This 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 particular lighting, I've got two things going on here. I basically have a three quarter backlight, which I'm using that as essentially my my. Uh, Horsepower, to be honest, it's giving me stop. I'm using this white disc. I change this. I have pieces of uh, black velvet that I use on the disc because sometimes I'll move those things around to shape the reflection so it's not just all white coming up. I'll say, oh, I don't want to kill something. Or I want to bring something up through the shaft. Like, I don't want that to be white. I want it to go away. I shoot against, in the case of this, I shoot against black velvet. Um, that is what's known as photographic black velvet. It is insanely expensive. It's about $60 a yard. And uh, I have to take very good care with it because what it gives me the advantage of is if I use just like a piece of black that's off the truck, it still picks up black. And that is, if I can't get that pristine black, I'm out of business. You have to use it, then you gotta do it. Or else, and also the reason is it can bring it right into the set. This lens is, this is a unique lens, which we're probably talking about it over here. Um, probably most of you haven't seen a lens like this, or maybe you've seen one at, you know, like Cine Gear or something like that. It's an InnoVision Pro lens. I bought this in probably 1982. At that time, I paid 30,000 for this, right here. On the end of it, is what they call the objectives. This objective, there's basically four objectives. They go anywhere from 12. They're, the numbers are really irrelevant because of the way it runs through the whole relay system. But uh, uh, basically it goes from uh, 12 to 35, I think, uh, 32 is the final objective. I tend to work at 16 or 20. I just like the look of it. Um, but when you go to like a 12, Two things happen. One is I literally blow off the set. With that 12, I can't have the light in this close. So now I gotta use a larger light source. I have to use a larger reflected source. So this being four feet, now all of a sudden it has to become literally an eight by eight. Because I'll see the edges. It'll be reflected in this metal. I'll see that the, I've run out of, of, uh, of, ref, of uh, reflective surface. So that is really problematic. That's the same thing here. This, normally if I was doing this thing, it's, it's encased. We literally have black thrown on all sides. I'm not even using this light because I don't feel I need it right now. Uh, but, because uh, um, the problem is, I see everything. I see myself. I wear black. I'll, I'll sometimes wear it all the way down. I'll have it literally, you can, I'll see myself in some of these clubs, in, unfortunately, in dailies. <laughs> You're like going, oh, I see a little piece of white flesh. And it happens to be my hand because I'm pulling focus or something. 
that's on there. So you're constantly looking for those things. Um, or something that doesn't, you know, that I'm not concerned about reflection. I just need a light source and I need a, a wide source. No problem. But I'm working on glass or that surface. Picks it up. It, it picks it right up. Picks and I right just up. see chain link. Because once again, this lens to carry that focus carries that focus all the way up. You know, I'm generally working on this lens, which is pretty high stop. I run usually around 11 to 16 split. Wow. You know, oh, everyone, that's the first thing. Well, how fast do you lens? It's a 5.6. I could care less. It means nothing to me. I will never shoot a 5.6. It's that's the last place I want to go for this kind of photography. Now, when I'm shooting people, portraits, things like that, you know, I love to work at a 2.8, a 3.2. I decided I'm, there's no need for me to go farther because that's what I'm looking for. I'm isolating. You know, that was one of the things that, you know, uh, D.W. Griffiths, one of the very first you know, directors, famous directors, one of his things was before that time, people made movies and it was basically producers. They looked at it and they said, oh, we can have a stage play and we have to get these actors every night, every night, pay the night. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, there's this new newfangled thing called a movie camera, the Edison, you know, all this stuff. Put a camera back here, shoot it one time, the producer makes money the rest of his life, and yeah. the actors get paid one day. Genius, right, for the producer. Not good for actors, but genius for the producer. When D.W. Griffith came along, he liked that thing. He said, okay, we've seen the stage play. Everyone goes to Nickelodeon and we see the same boring thing. It's just, it's cross-lit, because that's the best they had. Trust me, the, the lighting units they had was laughable. Electricity was barely invented. That's why they used stages that literally rotated in the sun, right? I'm sure you guys have seen Black Mariah and those ones. That's, they hadn't needed that much light, right? So they put the stage on the same rotate. But anyway. D.W. Griffith came along and he said, I'm going to change it. He essentially invented both framing and editing. He looked at it and he said, I'm going to force the audience to actually see this close-up. I'm forcing you to see what I want you to see. I'm not letting you see the rest of the club. You know, even if there's a bad portion of it, I'll make sure you never see that. It. It's my clients. That's my job. And he said, I'm going to force you to see this motion. There's a tear in their eye. I'm going to have the camera right there. And that is what is... You've got to remember that. So when, I, when you, as a cinematographer, and you're shooting whether this or people or whatever, don't ever forget what you're trying to accomplish in that moment. It's your audience. You know, sometimes people chase the perfect frame, perfect lighting. No, it's you know, it's this, it's that, it's all. That's not necessarily the story. And you're fighting the story. That's what's really important. Don't forget that. It might be as simple. I was in San Francisco. We just caught in three o'clock last night. I lean on and. We were shooting some interviews up there, and we were in a building, and they had, basically, they had, we brought our lights and all that stuff, and they had two solar tubes, which you guys are sure aware of, they're like these portholes, in, and I just looked at it, and the guy who happened to be like sitting on the corner of this table, the director had put him up there, and I'm like looking at it, and I'm going, I'm not changing it. There's nothing I could do to make the shot better. If I added, if I added light, what's going to happen is in the background, it's going to start to come down. It's going to crash. Now, if I want to do that, it's cool. But I want it to feel like he's in his office. I want the office to have life. But at the same time, where he was, because there basically was, you know, what Mike was talking about. Here's a backlight. Because the solar tube happened to be behind his left shoulder. You know, and the other one just happened to be over his right. And I'm like going, I'm not changing anything. It, I couldn't improve that frame for that story. It worked. It was. It had the industrial edge that I could only wreck by lighting. 
right? So don't ever forget that, you know, when you're lighting, don't sit there and don't get hung up in the mechanics. I can tell a lot of people there's all kinds of different cameramen. I mean, I started in an era when, you know, I mean, I shot everything as a kid from eight millimeter, not super eight, eight millimeter to 65 millimeter. You know, I've shot this division. I've obviously been in the digital world. I was an early adapter because I looked at it and I said, I owned a lot of movie cameras, which I leased in Hollywood, and I sold all my movie cameras real early on and got out. So I'm like going, it's, we're dealing with wagon wheels. People that are still like, oh, you know, it's got this big, oh, it doesn't. You're kidding yourself. These things have more versatility between what's happening in here and what's happening in post that you can't touch in film. It's just, you're kidding yourself. Anyway, I get off track. Um, but what you really want to do is don't ever forget the essence of, your, of what you're trying to accomplish. That frame is really important. Um, um, Can I throw yeah, out another? Yeah. You mentioned liquid lighting or, or moving. Yeah. Can you kind of give us a... Do we have a... Uh, I need like a 3 by 4 or 18 by 24 <coughs> Oh, yeah. Black. Black, not a flop. How did I find it? Can you go to the I know. Let's do it on just a second. Add it. Ooh. Oh. Is that your own? Oh, good. 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 I want you to notice that he's taken a piece of foam core, cut a slit in it so it fits in with the shaft of the club, and that foam core is very, very clean. That's because that's what you're seeing in the club. Everything, everything that he's lighting, everything that he's illuminating here are surfaces. Uh, he's, what you're seeing in the club are those surfaces reflected. So the surfaces are, as I said that this is a great. Did you see the front guys? See what's going on there? And basically, let's take that. I don't need enough for a while. Can you turn that light a little bit back on? Take more edge. Now you can see some of the value. See how close that these lights are working against that black background. That's why I use black. Photographic black belt. Okay. See, so basically, I'm getting into a place here. Where I'm keeping it really right down on there. So I'm just kind of seeing the essence of the club. Is that a Who cares? Now, metal and glass and things like that, it's a good thing. It's a lot of times, like the club heads we use that are uh, dry, drivers are more rounded. And so they, they really, really show that as it crawls around it. Um, so, how do you solve that? Bigger sources. Bigger sources, bigger blacks. That's one of the things because, and a lot of times I'll go on a longer lens because I'm fighting that rig. Um, yeah, six by six. I used to carry a lot. Um, the largest Shamir, which is the four by six. And I would use that with the uh, 1200 par. That's a ton of light. It's a ton of light, but it's amazing. You need a ton of light. You know, it's, yeah, there's all kinds of ways. I can ramp this thing up or any other camera, but you're gonna get all kinds of noise in that black, which is, once again, might not be a problem for something else, but for what I do, it becomes a problem. 
people, your clients you're going to attack. Christine? Mark, I have a quick question about the uh, probe itself. Yeah. Okay. It's actually a two-part question. We have uh, Pardon? We have yeah. Oh, turn that on. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is... Okay, well, there you go. Uh, so two questions. Uh, first of all, is the uh, objective pro projecting onto a uh, flat plate of some sort? Uh, so it's going straight into the... Straight in. You can look right through the two. Okay, so the next question then is, how much distortion are you getting from that? Because the, the, the sensor on this, I don't know how big, is it like 7, 35? Yeah. Okay, so how much distortion are you getting from the 12, it's 12 meter, 12 mil, it's a 12, Thank you. <laughs> 12 millimeter objective is what you're using right now? No, this right now is a 16 that I've got on it. Okay, so how much uh, distortion is there from that? It's pretty, pretty straight. Yeah. That's, that's part of the deal on the Innovision Pro. Yeah, $30,000. Thirty thousand dollars thirty years ago, I think there's going to be a very little distortion. Yeah, I mean, I've like I said, I've had this thing on every generation of cameras. I mean, imagine in the day, like for instance, when you're on film and you got a magazine, I got a whole different. I love the way things are now because I can get everything like right over the top. When you have a magazine, this thing's up, that's out. I got a ton, ton of weight. You start putting the camera, like especially if I'm rolling and it's dragging film. <laughs> It's like, snap, you know, things like that. Oh, the other thing I should bring up too, on product photography for a lot of this stuff, I run off frame. In other words, I rarely shoot at what would be normal, either 24 or 30 frames. I just don't do that because, which is another problem for lighting, is because I'll reach, go, I'll shoot at 60. And, uh, or sometimes more, but generally 60. And that means I lose a stop. So now I need twice the amount of light. So you just, Chase, I call it chasing the drag. You always, are, these things are going through your head like, oh, can I get away with it? Can I break that and stuff? This, if this thing is parked and I can, I can do it like, I can just turn in half the speed, I grab, I go back to 30 frames. But if I'm actually dealing with like food, any of that stuff, I want it to have that sex coming up. You know, that, that's really important in the end. I pay for that. I need more light. Bigger source. Bigger source, bigger reflective, bigger everything. Um, I mean, what's yeah. your question? I'll repeat it. Um, if, like a lot of the examples we've seen on there, you, you can play a lot with the light because of the reflections, like it's metallic or it's a glass. So when you're shooting things that might be a bit more drab, like plastic or food, what are the lighting tricks that you use to make them look like? The well, question is, when you're shooting things that aren't reflective, like uh, food or flat surfaces, how do you light that differently? Generally, they'll be that if. if uh, well, let's just step back for two seconds. In photography, our eyes see in 3D. I mean, I, this is, you know, pretty basic stuff. We see, th because of our eyes, we see 3D. Cameras don't see 3D. 3D cameras do, but not regular cameras. It's a 2D image. So we're giving the illusion as photographers. And how do you do that? It's backlight, it's sideline, it's awesome. We're giving the sense what's happening in the background. That's an illusional thing. So when I'm shooting something like plastic or something, I may still use these. Or smaller ones because I don't want it just crawling like this thing. I want it to crawl over the product. If I want something to have a little more crispness to it, I'm going to use a smaller source. I'll use half this size as a key. And now I'll generally take, I've got a couple, I mean, I have one in one of my boxes, I think I have one of those little focus spots. It's one of the, the kit, the plastic ones. Yeah. Yeah, not that one. And there's a, there's a, uh, there's, this should be our head already open. You see what I mean? Yeah, grab those heads and grab them. No, it just that. Just this. Yeah. Now, Probably one of the things that's in your guys' minds is you're like going, why is he shooting with hot lights? Which, by the way, they actually do get extremely hot. Um, why? Part of the reason is I can learn any frame rate. You know, that's a big advantage to me. I am not, I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you that I don't use, uh, 
I don't use LEDs. I do. I travel with them all the time. They're fantastic. Battery powered. It's quick. It's uh, super efficient. Um, but I don't personally like the quality. Uh, but I use it because once again, I don't exceed the need. When I say I don't like the quality, right now LEDs are kind of going through this weird growth phase, and uh, most of them are multi multi light sources like those little panels, those little handheld ones, they'll have a hundred, they'll have a thousand, whatever. Little pinpoints of light. And uh, that's okay, it's not to you though. I'm gonna show them the pieces to it though. But, um, so to, to avoid that, <laughs> that's okay, throw it anywhere. That's a demonstration of gravity, so. Yeah, right, <laughs> gravity uh, check, gravity check. That's the problem. No, um, so what I'll do on, on LED sources is, uh, for two reasons, one is, is I put a piece of diffusion, a piece of 216 or 250, I don't know if there's an example around here, um, and I put that over the face. And the reason why is I take those hundred little tiny little, yeah, I usually a little thicker, but this, this is basically this, this kind of thing. And though, you know, when it's nice and thick, what it does is now turns all those hundred little light bulbs into one source. Okay, and that is, pretty critical because when I see it in people's eyes, I'd rather see one source. That's how you can light. You normally see skylight. We're programmed pretty much to see natural lighting. And uh, so I always, uh, but in stuff like this, this is one of the units where like, if I'm working in, in a different like plastic or jewelry, something that I want to have kit, is I use these little units because what I can do is I can A, put it right down where I want. I can put a slash, I can do, I can just highlight one area. Sometimes what I'll do is, like in the case of this, is I'll take a light source, because once again, this is reflected, right? Right now it's just reflecting this big soft source. I'll take one of these, or I'll take a 1K, and I'll literally put a hot circle right down here, screaming hot. And of course that light's coming back up, but what it's doing is giving me a different quality, because I'm actually seeing that hot piece of light, you know, and that might be a little area, like if I have a logo or something in there and I really, or a deep, deep pocket or another, uh, some other feature that they want to see, that's what I'll use and I take advantage of, it's not just a light source. Um, what these have is they also have little blades, can you see these things moving? So these little blades allow me to... How many? There's four blades, and you can swivel them, you can push them in, and you can adjust these things, and then of course it also focuses, so you can make it sharper. Uh, if you want that, you know, like sometimes you want that really, really, most people, you know, a lot of times, oh, I want to put a slash on the wall or whatever else, you know, they make multiple size units like this, probably maybe a couple laying around here, just under the face. Right here. Here. goes up there, yeah. And they have blazing just like that, and it's, it just saves so much time. It's mostly you just don't have the cluster of equipment to make just a slash. If you got one of those, or order one when you're prepping your grip truck, I think we're just talking about one of the things that people starting in this industry today, and this is not like some kind of a tear, but it, we don't know if it's economic, we don't know really what the deal is, but very few jobs allow people, whether it's the gaffers or the grips or you know, the camera department or frankly even production, to properly prep a job. You know, fail to plan, plan to fail. There's, that's why that saying is there because so much of your problems are solved the day before or the week before by just making sure, oh, this is actually gonna work tomorrow on the set. You know, it's a good idea to have this thing blow up the day before so that you can actually do something with it. You know, it was broken down now and we had $100,000 riding on a 30 second spot. A lot of people, especially looking at the DV, that are just going, huh, what, why are we shooting? Uh, Cause this isn't working. And no one would send somebody to prep it. So, you want to plan in your in your jobs to either <coughs> tell your producer, look, I need extra time. When we were setting this thing up, I told Mike, Mike, I need two hours in the morning. Now we did it quicker than that, which was great. But I told him that because I knew this doesn't fall off the truck. It takes a while. It's a pain in the ass. And trust me, when we're doing it in the real world, there's a lot more stuff that's all around here. Like I said, I got wax behind me. I draped this whole thing because it's seeing this. Believe it or not, I mean, I fight that lens, it sees it, so I have all kinds of little tricks to, to deal with it, and it all takes time. So that's what goes back to the question, when a producer says, well, how long is it going to take? I can lie to them. 
I generally, from experience, if I, if I hit, say I have to shoot, I, trust me, I never get to shoot one club. That's never happened. Generally speaking, somebody comes in and they either have a full bag of clubs, a full series, I got like 11 clubs to shoot, and they're all completely different. And they go, oh, we want to have a company. We want individuals of all of this, and we want them spinning and twisting and see every feature. Oh, the feature, like the space. They want to see the space. Well, the space is like something that is important to them that requires me to light in a certain way. They want to see all these little grooves that are in there. I'll use that unit. Yeah, sure. They, they, uh, yeah, let's just do a quick thing. Let's, let, let's actually, let's fire this light up. Just a second. Um, so, every one of those clubs has a different feature. It starts, in fact, with different sizes, so it's not you just plug and play. Every one of the clubs has to be cut to a certain length. Uh, let's bring it in, like, see if we can put it in here somewhere. Yeah, just tell me the size. So we got it pretty good. Um, um, set of clubs. You know, this is this is a putter. You're gonna have a putter. You're gonna have your irons. You're going to have a uh, set of doors here Um you're gonna have you're going to have, uh, they're all uniquely shaped. The dryers particularly because they're domed. That's, that's just, it's, it's like a fisheye lens. It sees the entire world. And uh, so you got to deal with that and, and lighting it. And right here. Is it on? Is it on? Should be the blow. Strike. There you go. I like to hear that. So we're going to plug in somewhere right there. Why don't you try a different circuit? You did a gravity test. Oh, hi there. Gravity load. Is there a bolt in there? This is, this is a no bolt. Um, bear in two seconds. That doesn't have a bolt in it? That happens more than once for my life. You've got to prepare for that. Exactly. It's not crap. It's not crap. <laughs> The other thing, when I attended the, the seminar years ago, one of the things that I discovered is that the people who are really, really good at this sometimes make the same mistakes that I do. It made me feel better. I almost have a spare bulb. I got spare bulbs. Let's see if this works. There it is. That's bright. Okay. Um, yeah. There's a couple of things that, you know, I was kind of, I don't know how, how fortunate some of you are to get a chance to, okay, what we're trying to do here, guys, is, can you see that, those yeah. screws? Yeah. 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 And, uh, So you're seeing why well, you get into it. Sorry, attendees. I'm going to turn this to him so he can see the monitor and get it right. Okay. See this one's this light comes in? See those grooves? Those grooves are, that's a very important thing to that shot. Right now it's way overexposed. We've got the tools, we slow this all down. But I'm looking for that texture. That's what this light's giving me. This light is taking, there's no texture there. 
There's exposure, but there's no texture. Let me turn this back toward them so they can see it as well. Mm -hmm. See that? Gives a, texture. A gives a character. No texture. On this particular product, that is something that's critical for the person that's paying. You know, that's the story. That's forcing your eye into something that's important for that frame. I might look at it and go, I don't know as well tell you this. I want to get paid for the job. You know? So if they say, no, I'm going to see me. Yeah, I have no issue with that. And I think that's something you need to remember, you know, when you're coming up. What I was going to say is that this town's a little unique compared to my experience coming up because I was fortunate enough to work as a camera assistant for nine years. In that time, I worked with a lot of just, once again, luck. I just happened to hook up with some people that were really good at their craft, you know? And one of them, special effects, we were talking about special effects, he had won the special effects, the, the Academy Award for Superman. He was a director. And I hooked up with him, and it was like, <laughs> every day, just put knowledge in. Because there's crap that this guy knew that, trust me, he went to the grave with, and people are not going to know because he was in that world, that thing. He had experimented. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. Experiment. Like I said, light it, start turning off lights. If you do that on your jobs, mm -hmm. if you have any kind of time at all, you're going to learn so much from that experience because that's where you really start to see the essence of photography. And the other thing is, I'm one of these people that, you know, despite all this crap and that I do build these things and stuff, is, uh, is I think there's different kinds of camera people. I think there's people that are just really hardcore technocrats. You know, they know everything about it. Oh, if, 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 blah, 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 what's going in there? I could care less. I really could. I mean, Dr. Hyde, my assistant, is like, I, he's a technocrat. He's a technocrat. I don't care. That doesn't do anything for me because all I care is what I can deliver with. You know, now I don't get to sound completely, you know, I understand how to manipulate this the same way I manipulate film as far as speed and use, but that's photographic. But I could care less about anything that has to do with the actual technology that's in red or an Alexa or this or that. There's so many people, in my opinion, get completely hung up on. Even still photographers. Oh, the size of the megapixels. Blah, 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 blah. We all know that we've taken the perfect photo on our iPhone at some point in time. Not that maybe it was technically perfect. Maybe it was. But it contained the essence of what you were trying to convey. Oh, it's your family. Or it's a beautiful sunset. Or whatever it is. That moment you captured. The best camera you have is the one that's with you, right? And so it's the same thing. So this thing, you know, so I just really try to tell the camera people that are coming up, don't get hung up in that. Don't get hung up in the, need, the latest fad or anything else. I'm working with these tools because they're just, they, they do work. the job. They work. They work. Right. I'm sure there's some kind, I could use some kind of electronic thing that has blah, blah, blah. Dimmer, I do use dimmers occasionally, but a lot of times it's all just about wire. I just wire them down, you know, it's old school. Why? Because I'm looking at color temperature. That's something that a lot of people forget. And what? the product, that's really important. Yeah. What's the color temperature that you're using? Right now, this 30, one right now, because of the way your light is and stuff, it's probably running about 29, 2900. Yeah. The camera's set at 3200. Yeah. The camera is set at 3200. The. Uh, so, well, yeah. So, nice. you know, that, but um, obviously, I, I sometimes mix fighting. Like, sometimes, who's got a. Uh, anybody have like an LED flashlight? I will turn it back. It's like sometimes, you know, lose. Mm -hmm. yeah. See those about sometimes that thing right there. Like particularly when I'm doing not necessarily metal, because once again when I talked about cars. See that? On, on hot metal, you don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. And you see most car commercials, you yeah. rarely ever see hot light. Can you do that again, Gary? Yeah. So that you can see. So the exit, um, normally this would be a little bit brighter. But can you see the, can you see the light coming across it? Yeah. That spotlight? It looks really cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. and it's a mixed color. Yeah. This thing right here is basically daylight balance. It's completely different than a backlight. But what it's doing is sometimes I'll use, not particularly this one, but I'll use maybe my backlight. I'll use daylight. You know, people, oh, you can't mix it. I mix it all the time. 
flat, you know, any slashes and stuff like that, like if I was lighting the set, there'd be a lot, there's a good chance that I would be using mixed light on it. It just, something I um, Yeah. That's Question? So I imagine that a certain amount of what you do has been replaced by CGI. So Some for, has. For the producers in the room, why, why should I have you come and do it live with a camera as opposed to CGI? And I'm going to repeat that from the live feed. Uh, for the producers in the room, why should we do this, photograph this live as opposed to do it CGI? Want a truthful answer? Because I can, at the end of the day, give you this, and you're never going to get CGI at the end of the day. And every producer is always his client. In the case of this tailor made, they wanted it yesterday. This may have actually, not this particular club, obviously, but the, they'll oh, give me a prototype. Well, that's the other thing. That is, like, for instance, on toys. Uh, it's called toys delivery. And it's called cars, delivery. They're always prototypes. Very rarely do I get a production. If it goes to production, it's already a done deal. They sold. In the case of the toy world, because I, if you saw in there, I did Barbie, I did Hot Wheels, I did tons of that stuff. Every one of them has a different one. Barbie, straight up fashion, is totally different. I mean, it's all about fashion. She's a billion dollar baby. There was a time when an average girl in America had bought seven in her childhood. Every one of them has a lot of clothing. It's a money maker. It's a, it's a Hot Wheel cars. Every guy in this room has had a hot wheel car. Probably had a lot of them, you know. Uh, that requires something else, um, because now you're working with something that's that big, and it's moving. There's a lot of tricks to that, like for instance, so I can tell you guys all this stuff, there's only one problem. At the end of the day, I'm gonna have to kill all of you. <laughs> <laughs> but you learn something, at least for a few hours. <laughs> um, how do you get those shots? Here's this Hot Wheels car. It's probably at scale doing 150 miles an hour. It's screaming down the track. You can't fall with this camera. What I do? I make a tape. It's 30 feet long. It's on, it's on track doll. Okay? Built the whole thing on it. I put the, I put the, the runway, the, the, the straightaway of that track on there. I take a piece of tungsten wire and I attach it to the back of the car. Okay? I'm three quarter front. That's what we always see those cars. It's, uh, it's just in regular, regular car commercials. You shoot three quarter front, man. Once again, we're giving you the illusion of three dimensions, right? If I shoot it on the side, it's pretty boring. I want to see. I want to see pieces of the car. I want to see three quarter. So what we'll do is I'll take the piece of tungsten wire and I essentially lock it. It's it's literally it's on a C stand, not attached to this this rolling dolly. And I'll put it on a C stand, tungsten wire going to the back of the Hot Wheels car. Set the probe right down at ground level, right? And now what I do is I roll this whole thing backwards. The car is going backwards, right? And it's screaming, but it's in perfect focus. It's right in the middle. It's a beauty. You see all the stuff going in the background and all that stuff? That's how you do it. There's no other way. I, did, I would still be shooting my very first hot wheel car 20 years later if you actually did it, what do you think? There's no way you can do it. So but it's a trick of the eye because that tungsten wire that's behind it, you're never looking at that wire. You're always looking in front of the car. It's a magic trick. So it's like, okay. You learn little things like that, how to, how to, you know. There's all kinds of ways that you can prop things and trick things and backwards, upside down, uh, things like that. But that's a, that's a really good example because <coughs> you're lighting a car. I could just throw this light up there, you know. But they really want to see, like, all the nuances. They want to see the chrome. The wheels are important. A lot of those cars are like, um, Legacy cars, like they're kind of like, you know, they're of, of either cars that they're emulating that are famous or whatever, and they, they got to have it shot exactly like if you're shooting that real car on your stage. One of the things I like about my job when I do tabletop is when you shoot real cars, um, you have massive, like I've shot cars where literally this now is 40 by 60 feet strung over the perimeter. Why? Because the car's got all these angles. It's going everywhere, right? And so that whole thing is rigged, and it's on cables, and I can drop it and move it and all that stuff. You're looking for reflective angles, and on the, all the chromes reflect the wheels. You know, all that stuff is massive reflective sources. It takes a long time to deal with it. And then once you're locked in, and somebody goes, look, the car is just chugging. And it's like, have you been watching? <laughs> you know, you know, you just want to go, sure. 
let's move it. We'll move everything, you know? I had, I think knows this story. I was shooting um, uh, Batman. I, I did Terminator, Batman, all those toys. I'm sure some of you probably own some of those. And uh, those are really valuable products because those movies, like in the case of, of uh, Terminator, they had paid uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger an enormous amount of money just to use his likeness on the toy. If you look at the toy, on, on, on Terminator 1 particularly, I mean, it's, it's, it's him. Um, did, did Batman, Joker, Jack Nicholson, they paid him a ton of money to just get his likeness on that toy. And of course, they want to see that, right? So now I'm lighting a human. It's, it's only this tall, but it's a human, right? They want to see all that's going with it. Anyway, so we had a set a little bigger than this, and it was like this back cave. Whoa, back real quick. I'm trying to take the turn. Um, is on, on toys. There's some rules, like I told you, that you can, in the case of food, you can show anything fake except for what you sell. In the case of toys, you can never show a toy, two things. You can never show a toy that can't do something. If you're a kid back in the past and you see things that fly or did things like that, sold a lot of toys, kid gets it home, mom paid for it, and it doesn't do it. That's a lawsuit. Those lawsuits, the, the F, uh, FTC came down hard on the toy companies and said you can't advertise that way because you're, you're advertising to little kids, and little kids can be manipulated. That's not fair. I said, okay, fair enough. So in the case of, of any toy, it, it, can't, it has to do what it says it does, and I cannot show it from a perspective that a child could not see it. Now, you go, wow, what's that? Okay. Bottom. I, like, for instance, I could do a cool hot wheel spot, right? Because I could make a little rig that goes over the front of this or a lipstick cam or any other, you know, now GoPro or whatever, and it, I would be inside that hot wheels car. And I would rig that thing, the same thing. I'd put it on an arm, it would be all fixed, and I'd roll that track, you know, and you'd go like, oh man, I'm selling cars now. Because you are. It's exciting. It's what you see in NASCAR. Can't do that, Chuck. I got, one time I got shut down because I wanted to do a shot. You know how the Hot Wheels, they have the bank tracks, right? Mm -hmm. Mark and Brown's bank. And so I wanted to be in the inside of the bank. So I set the whole thing up. Here's the bank shot. And this one now, the camera's locked and we're going to do a live, because when the, the car is going to go around. And basically I had uh, the attorney, there's an attorney on set, and he goes, oh yeah. And then usually on a hotline to New York or somewhere else, it's, it's crazy. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's when I showed her, he goes, yeah, that shot. I'm like, I'm like, stand up, it's been an hour, right? It's like, I can't do the shot. And I go, why? He goes, because the kid cannot get inside the track. So when you see Hot Wheels tracks, you'll always see that you're on the outside of the track. You might be right on the edge, and as far as that shot I was talking about when I'm down at ground level, a kid can do that. They can lay on the ground. They can lay on the floor. Little kids will do that. Little boys will do that stuff, right? Uh, Barbie, you can always show that angle. She looks six feet tall. And on. You can show that angle because a girl, she can see that angle. But you can't, certain things, like I said, you can't read his eye, and you can't do certain things. But she died for the shot. You know it's going to be awesome, huh? <laughs> but anyway, back, back to Batman. So Batman, we build this big set, and what's going to happen is Batman's in the Batcave, he's a little action figure. And not a toy, I've never got a toy, it's an action figure. <laughs> and Batman's going to come up, and so we, we're sitting there dreaming, you know, I was directing it, and I'm like going, and shooting. And I thought, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to build this, this um, uh, plastic plexi cylinder. And we're going to underlight it, super dramatic. And we're going to have this, it'd be like an elevator. This is going to come up. And he was going to be like, in this thing, smoking the set. This was in Vancouver. Totally cool. And so I said, I'm looking at him. And what I've done is the sets, that cave, I've raked it in blue light. It's basically black and blue. And it's like, once again, it's a trick of the eye. That whole set that you think, what they did is we made the walls out of it. We just took a thunder gray seamless paper you know, and like the color of your shirt. And we just wrinkle it. Have the PAs just like take the whole sheet and just beat it up and tear it up. And then we just up on the wall. And it looked like, to camera, it looked like this cool rock. So I raked it with blue light, you know, and here's like, you know, we don't care, it's coming from the moon, whatever. And that's when I'm going, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to, I'm going to split this. Of course, I got to remember, I got to still have a white source because I have to see <coughs> Batman <coughs> product. So I've got one of these little guys that's going to just highlight him. But when he comes up out of the ground, I was going to put red. <laughs> I'm going, 
this would be a cool contrast you know, with the smoke and all that stuff. So we do the shot, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah, killer, right? You know, you just you can feel it. You're like, oh, this is fine. And so I see the agency of the room. And they come over and they go, oh, you got James is we're going to get letters from somebody and they're going to say that Batman's coming from hell. And I'm like going, okay, let's find another thought. So I'm going, okay, so you're going to talk about Batman and you know, okay, well, let's, let's try like a, you know, like maybe an orange or something. Like that. Deep down in the middle of the room. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a message to all the crips and electricians. <clears throat> now remember, the way this thing worked there, when I was doing toys, is I'd go for seven days, we shoot seven days a week, you had one day off, then the next week you shot for five days, you had two days off, then the next week you shot for seven days. Your and every day it's tiny t technical stuff. This is hard on you. I mean, it's not yeah. physical and running up, but it's like a mental game that Hard really, die. anyway. So we're doing this, and over this time period, it's probably half an hour's time. Because we're changing this, it's on the rig, it's motion, the things like on the turntable on the ground. It's got a light coming up, obviously it's making a light, all that jazz, and yeah, it's like. <clears throat> and so, we're sitting there having a discussion. I turn, and I'm trying to think, okay, well, where do I go? I don't want to go to the cool light, because now it's going to run into the background. I'm certainly, I've got to change the background. You're tuning all this stuff. And the gaffer comes over and he goes, I can't say the word, he goes, can you just freaking make up your mind <laughs> to me? <laughs> you know? And I've got like, this battle of clients who are burning 100 grand a day. I mean, this, this is real dough. And I've got all this going on. I'm trying to think, you know, and I'm running a crew and I'm running it. And I turn to him, and I, and I don't do this. And I turn to him and I said, this is the food chain. I'm here. <laughs> You're here. Get the F out of my face. You know, it's like one of those deals because it's like, dude, I can't play this game with you while I'm trying to deal with it. Do you think I'm entertained? I had the perfect shot as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Those are the guys that are causing the trouble. So that's one of the balances when you're director of photography and you're, you know, not shooting your own. Um, you're gonna face those moments where somebody's telling you and you're in your mind. You've lit it the exact way that you, you know, that vision, you told that story that you want to tell, and you've got it all together, and then it's like, you know, somebody who just is, wants to ruin the party <laughs> comes along and tells you their version of the truth, you know? And what's in the back of your mind on that one is I don't want to get hired again, so hey, I don't care what you want. <laughs> you know, I mean, you want this white light, which is what we ended up with. We ended up with just a white light, light coming up. It was fine, but it wasn't. Cool. Gold liver. Yes. Hey, are there any other questions? Uh, questions? I'm going to check in the other room as well. Uh, how many days were you, or how many hours were you working? <laughs> the question is, how many hours a day were you working? Um, like I said, this stuff's all tedious. Uh, there's no days that I ever worked that's less than 12. Really, really rare on product because you just can't get through what you need today. Um, in the case of, you know, in the case of Mattel and stuff like that, lots. There's other factors that have nothing to do with camera work, but you have, you have issues with kids. And kids, depending on what the reason we went to Vancouver, is because they have virtually no child labor laws. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very dis disparaging kind of like comment that they were like Mexicans with sweaters. And that's, that was just terrible. But that's the fact. It's like there's nobody there. Except this will really freak you out. Is like I said, I shot there for years. And one day, it was like in the corner, it's a bunch of hard hats, construction hard hats. Oh, there's a new Canadian law. What's the new Canadian law? Okay, well, actually, two laws. One is, is that an electrician, a gaffer, has to actually have an electrical license, which is not required here. You know? And so you have to go to school, you have to, it has nothing to do with what we do. We have very specialized lighting and electrical sources and all that stuff. But you have to literally have that license that says you can, you know, wire a house and not kill somebody. Not necessarily a bad idea. But still, it's like, it has really no bearing on us. But the hard hats were, 
See these lights? You guys are in danger. You have to wear a hard hat. You have to wear a hard hat. You have to wear a hard hat. And now we're all trying to work in hard hats. Okay, good job. That lasted about a month before finally they went to the government and they said, look guys, this is, we put safety, this is a whole different deal, you're out of your mind, it just doesn't work. But to answer your question, 12, 12 to 14 hours is a normal day. So when you're doing, you know, a full week, seven days on, when you're doing this, you're pretty beat. Okay. You don't party hard. I wonder if you could say a few words about your sliders. I saw them on your website and uh. you got like, and what, uh, how they're different from other sliders on the market and like what you did to build those? The question is about the Mansky slider. Um, okay, well, like I said, the original one that I built was probably 25 years ago. And the original one I still have was actually made on a piece of wood. And I ran it with a whole different set of bearings. But I was doing uh, uh, Power Rangers. And we had these like Power Ranger cycles. And it was the only way that I could really deal with that one because I couldn't, I, I had three, Three motorcycles, and they really wanted to run. Anyway, so I built it. What's different? It's lighter. It's thinner. It's probably, for everybody else, in my opinion, they're overbuilt. Okay? They make them very thick. They're heavy. Um, heavy, for me, you know, I'm just going, I'm a minimalist. You know, it's like there's no reason for it to be that overbuilt. It uh, has a little different, I'm not knocking the other ones in a certain sense because I've seen some really good engineering. Um, but it does my job. It runs super smooth. Um, I have, I've had, let's call it flattery. What's, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I was copied. I got knocked off. Oh, you got ripped off. Yeah, I got ripped off. Yeah, it. I, was, I was in. I was just actually. I was just on eBay one day a couple years ago, and I saw my slider on eBay. And I'm like, oh, and it was like dirt cheap. It was like $700, which is impossible to do. The rails alone are $700 on this. And I'm like going, so there's a guy that was in India. And, he, and then I realized I had sold one to a guy in India. <coughs> right? And so he literally, he literally took the photos off my website, put it on his website, went on eBay. And so um, I'm a little fortunate. My wife's an attorney. And so... <laughs> They got a really hot-blooded letter and to both eBay and to him about basically like infringement. Infringement. It's very hard to you know to actually enforce anything you know internationally. Um, I mean, I could have this ripped off domestically. That's it's just it's at a point it's impossible. It's not worth the effort for what you make on. You know, I basically these things. I mean, at the end of the day, like I say, they're so labor-intensive. Like there's certain things, like I have a speed net on the bottom. That's where it starts. That's the, otherwise, all, all the other ones, guys are fishing for you know the thread and they're trying to find. This one you just turn it 90 degrees, it's locked. Time is money. That's one of the things I did to it. It obviously uh, it rotates, so I can run 360. I can do compound moves with it. Um, you know. What about the end plungers? That's one of my favorite. What's that? Those end plungers for the soft stops. Somebody's oh, yeah. asking about the end plungers well, for the soft stumps. Yeah, there's a little, I can't really turn it around here, but there, you can take a look at it when I'm off this. There's a little plunger system here which basically takes it to the end and it just kind of softens so you don't hit it because it seems like in, in, invariably yeah. that last frame is what you want. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh crap, you know. Bang. Okay, I have another question from the other room. Go ahead, Francine. Just tell me, you know. What piece of advice would you want a director to know when working with a cinematographer? And please use clean language. <laughs> um, you know, I actually, I have a, I have a, my personal philosophy on that is I, I check my ego at the door. If I'm directing and shooting, that, you know, that's a self-contained thing. But when I'm working with another director, I work with Mike, I work with a lot of other people, it's like, it's their movie. I'm not going to get in the way with their movie. It's like, if they want to like this way, they want to do this. I mean, I'm there to guide them, you know, to kind of like, because there, there are people that literally have no opinion in their director, and it's like, okay, so I'm going to help you. But then there's other people that are very specific about their opinions, and I think as a, once again, here, Jane, I'm here. 
director's here, right? I respect that. So if they're sitting there saying, look, I want to do this, or I don't want to do that, I'm not going to fight them on set. That's stupid. I do know that there are cameramen that do that. I mean, they'll, it, you know, uh, you'll see disrespecting just your clients, too, but you'll see, and we've all seen them. You'll see spots on the air, I don't care what it is, and you're like, oh, God, that was amazing. That thing was just nonstop cinema. It was beautiful. What was the product? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where's the branding? They completely failed. But what's happening is the director is usually doing this for his reel. He's, he's, going, he's thinking he wants to do features. He wants to do this also. And so they'll go in, and they'll, the client and the agency that worked on it for you know, months, on the kind of the concept and all that stuff, and he'll just start pushing, yeah, 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 I got it, I got it. And you'll see that, and you're like, okay, you know? Now, once again, I'm not going to get in the way of him and his clients, but you, you go, yeah, it looks like fantastic cinema. I'll give you a quick, when I was assisting, um, I was working for a guy, Derek Van Lind, and uh, he was a Brit, and uh, he was director camera, and uh, uh, he had shot Soldier Orange, and, and he had done uh, um, the original Alien, first Alien, and he was a great guy, and it was really funny, because as a camera assistant, you know, like, everyone thinks, oh, it's a technical thing, I always looked at it as an assistant, as, as I am an assistant, and so he'd walk in, and I knew him, he was a Brit, two things happened, when I came, First thing, I came a half hour early. These are all good lessons for people that are thinking about it. I'd always come a half hour early. So when the camera or the director walks on set, 8 o'clock call or whatever, this is built. They can't do anything until this is built. They can't look through the lens. I would have the zoom. I'd have it on, I'd have it on wide, maybe at the 20 or whatever it was. So they can see this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm done. It. The next thing, so he walks over and he goes, okay, I'm great. And, he, uh, and I would have a cup of coffee and I'd light his cigarette. He's a Brit. They don't, they don't breathe without a cigarette. <laughs> so he's just kind of smoking the set one cigarette at a time. You know, I don't smoke, but you know what? But I'll tell you, he was a guy that told me to start turning off lights. He did Alien. Let's not argue about Alien. Was one of the, he had a huge battle with the agency, on, on the agent with the studio, on lighting with Ridley Scott, and they wanted it edgy. They, the deal was, this is a monster movie. You will never see the monster until the last reel. That's it. That was their thing. And the studio is going, we paid a lot of money for this monster. We want to see this monster in the first frame. That's how far apart they were. And the studio is like going, you guys are going to be fired. Blah, blah, blah. You're going to start changing. You want to see more. Blah, blah, And I'll give them credit. Him and Ridley just stood their ground. And they said, in this case, you guys are wrong. And we're going to bring you this movie. And if you never hire us again, cool. And if you want to fire us, that's not a problem either. Because trust me, I trust, I believe in myself. So I'm going to take this as far as I can. And we saw the results. Alien looks amazing. But um, yeah, he was a, uh, he was really a master of like basically, like I said, he'd go in and like, one of the things I do, which uh, maybe you noticed here, more importantly, which I'm a little different than a lot of DPs, I like from the back to the front. And people go, why do you do that? You know, it's just like, you know, but I, I need to kind of see the environment that's going to be played in. And so if I came in here and I was like a set or whatever, I would literally start probably with the wall. I'll deal with the person who was in it later, but I want I want to see the thing. You know, I'm, I'm processing. Oh, it's what time of day? Night, day, dawn, late sun. All that thing's going. I want to see all that crap. I don't have to build that later because I found that it's like painting. You can literally paint yourself lighting wise into a corner because one of the things that I'm dealing with is okay. There's the wall. Here's my talent. And I'm gonna light like this. I got to think about what that light's doing to that. Let's say I have two walls set like this, and I'm looking at them and going, I'm not going to light them. You know, I'm not going to light them from this side because it's going to contaminate all that. I'm going to light them from this side. So all that's in shadow. So all that detail that I put on that wall, I saved it. It's a big mistake to paint yourself in that corner. And you, you got to, you know, you got to be ready to also tell yourself, I screwed up. I got to do this now. Change it. Not sit there and go, like, oh, I'm just going to shoot through it. They'll hate tomorrow. I mean, another quick deal as advice, too, is I had a, a uh, really good mentor, uh, Terry Claremont, who used to uh, own Claremont Camera in Hollywood. And uh, he and I, you know, had a lot of time together. And one of the things he told me when I started shooting was, um, I'm sure I'm bringing this, but when I, when I was shooting, he said, I'll stop you. They will never, and you gotta remember this, no matter how long, like you sit and you go, oh, I gotta go, and, and you decide, eh, it's clean enough or it's, it's whatever the deal is, that's never going to go away. If there's hair on there or some problem, tomorrow it's there. 
I told Lila the first day when he was working on a job with me years ago in Tel, and I said, I said, and I told it, told it to every assistant because I was an assistant, and I said, there is only one mistake that you can make today, and that's not to tell me that you made a mistake. Human nature just goes like, mm, uh, <laughs> if, if the stop was set wrong or. Something, anything, the things off speed, whatever else. No excuse. It's it's there tomorrow. It's in, it's burnt in, you know. So even if the day is a disaster, I mean, like you find out at like four in the afternoon, it's like you got to own up to it, and you go, you know what? I got to tell the producer, and we're gonna say we got to reshoot that shit. Here's the reason why. I have to, and they, they appreciate it. They don't like it, but they know that coming back tomorrow, that's an expensive mistake. That's what I'm saying. You've got to always remember to own up to it. <laughs> you know, you say put eight hours a day in, and I'm, I'm laughing. You know. The thing is, how many hours do you put into prep? They have to give you product. Uh, you have to find out exactly what they're looking for. So yeah. You can't talk to them directly. So when you have all these days, do you have a white paper? Do you have something in writing to show your, your crew what you're looking for to save time? Well, the, the, the question for the live feed is, uh, what do you get from the client? What do you do in prep, prep to, to make sure that you're ready at call time on the first shoot day? Um, OK, well, in the case of like when you're directing and shooting like toys, is that obviously you have a multitude of meetings between the client and the agency. Right. And they have a concept, whatever that is. And they kind of give you that parameter. And then basically, it's your job now to make boards. And the boards are kind of involved because it's not like a movie where you can it's two hours, two, two minutes and 15, whatever, it doesn't matter. This thing, this has to be done in 30, you know? And so you have to make boards up, and then you submit those boards. Another meeting breaks out, and then you submit the boards, and everyone kind of chews on that, and they go like, oh, we can't see that. We've got to show, like, once again, these weird-ass rules. They have a monetary rule in toys. And at the time, you, have a you cannot have a toy. You can have one child in frame, but that was a toy. And that toy cost $50 or less. I only need one kid in there, OK? That kid can play with it. If that toy is $51, I have to have two kids in it. And it's like, why? And it's like, you have to have two kids in it because it's at a price point where a parent may go, oh, I just, I'm not going to buy my kid. But I have two kids. They can play together. Now they're not bored. So parents, they've done all these studies. Trust me, they go like, oh, they'll go there. And so like products like Legos, Connects, those kind of building toys and stuff are actually pretty expensive. They're expensive to produce. Uh, Legos particularly are expensive to produce. And so every time you see one, Hot Wheels, you see a Hot Wheels set, there's always like three or four kids in it. Because mm -hmm. the cars, they always have, they want to see a lot of cars. Each car is like three or four bucks. So you'll see like 15 cars on you know, one kid. You can probably buy 15 cars. So if you put eight hours of shooting in, how many hours do you actually put in to get that shot? 16, 20, maybe? Oh, to get the shot? Well, I mean, with, with, the, with, the, prep, with the prep and everything. Yeah, you also have to ask your kids. The question, <laughs> is, the question is how much prep per shoot day? There's at least a day per in, in advance from a technical standpoint. As far as like, you know, once you get done arguing about <laughs> discussing <laughs> vehemently. Yeah, what you want and what they need on that job, you know, what she has to do with, okay, we're done with casting, we like those kids, blah, blah, blah. You know, you always have a backup kid because that kid that you love is going to have a meltdown or be sick or whatever. And so you have all that going. Uh, and then it gets down to, okay, now I need to talk to my electrical department, my grip department, my camera department, and you sit down and then you, you really take that script, what's left of that thing, and that is a good solid day. Now, I'm working the night before to, so I can convey it to them. And then that all has to go out since it's all rented, we try to do it. So usually from beginning to end on a toy spot, I've never been called in shorter than two weeks in advance. You need that much time to actually like make sure all the ducks are lined up. Because once again, you know, uh, uh, fail to plan, plan to fail. It's sure. really so it's just not eight hours. You, it's oh, a lot more than that. I, I've never, like I said, I've never shot an eight-hour day yeah. on toys for sure. I've never shot. I've, I've had in my whole career. I would probably be 
I've probably maybe only done less than a 10 hour day three or four times in my life. We may have to do this someday, and we'd like, I'd like to know exactly yeah. what we're getting into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the pro here, but we don't. We have no idea what's going yeah. on. Yeah, I mean, well, I, you know, like something like this, where there's no kids obviously involved in this product and all this stuff, that's pretty straightforward. And also, it's just, they're looking at just sort of like a montage. It's not really specific. We, we, could, we could give them two hours of the footage, and the editor's going to go and cut. I don't edit. You're done with the job. Whether it's kids or whatever, as soon as we're done shooting, that's it. Even the cut is not the director's choice. We have no input. So that's why it's really important on, on, on my storyboards, when I put storyboards out, I'm very clear about my edit. That doesn't mean they're gonna follow it, but at some point they've agreed to it. Also, which is something that's a little bit unique to San Diego, is that most jobs in San Diego are not boarded. You know, they're, they're, I consider them a little rough. And in LA, in New York, is that is a legal document. Mandatory. Well, no, it's a legal document no matter what you're shooting. Because that, you've now agreed that we see these X amount of shots, okay. and we've decided that there's X amount of people, and we've decided that it's going to look like this, and sets like that. And so on the day when everybody starts getting creative over there, well, can you have a shot? Well, we can't have a shot if we have enough time. Of course, I'm going to give it to you if we have enough time. But if it's the difference between us getting in a 10 or 12 hour day to meet the budget, and it's now going to turn into a 14, that conversation has to take up because this is a legal document they agreed to. That's an important thing. You never have, you know, a situation like in LA where somebody kind of just throws something in and that, that everyone knows is going to cost the day. It just doesn't happen that way. Now that doesn't mean they don't agree to it. Most of them do. They they go like, yeah, we'll do another half day. Let's come back tomorrow. Fine. You know? Because they also look at that. They look at the OT, all that stuff's being thought about. You know, and it's like is it is it longer, is it better for the guys? Longest job I've ever done, legit job, on a day, 20 hours. So that's the real world. It's really hard. Yeah, it's, it's real. But that, that 20 hours is a rare thing. Usually it's, it's 12, 14. Pretty, pretty common. Okay, any other questions? Let me check in the other room real quick. Any questions in here? Do you guys kind of get this rig? Like you said, when Mike asked me to do this, it's like, yeah, there's... It's like anything else. There's a thousand ways to write this. This is this. This is not the way. This is a way. I think as camera people, you need to look at all that stuff. Every shot, you should look at it and think about it. You know, like how would I do it? Not not the way I do it. You do it. Do it your way. Um, what uh, question from the yeah. other room? What uh, format do you usually uh, record in? Do you usually record raw, 4K, higher. No, we generally, it, yeah, generally it's raw. 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 People are living raw. Gotta be raw. Um, but like I said, that, it, that usually, you know, I just had a situation, all those specs usually come from the editorial house, because they have a lot of other issues. They might be doing the effects. They might be doing all this other stuff. And so they generally tell us what you need to shoot it. And, you, and you hand that to Eileen? Oh yeah, whoever. Because you're, I, yeah, I, like I said, I, I don't care. You know, if that's what the editorial wants, it makes no difference to me. It, it only difference is if all of a sudden somebody says, I need this whole thing. I, and I have people who go, like, I need everything shot at 60 frames. They just want it at 60 frames. They want it a little bit crisper. They want to have the ability to kind of play with the speed and all that jazz. They just want more information. And it's like, no problem, you know? Except for, I need twice the amount of life. So now i got to talk to the gaffer and say, oh, what are we talking about? That's not happening. We need it bigger, we need it hotter, we need all this stuff. When uh, that situation you described before, where you are uh, director has one thing, you have a client, mm. and you're talking about that hierarchy. Yeah. When you catch yourself in between uh, a director who has his own agenda right. and a client who is your hiring and supervising, what? How do you play that? When you feel like it's going in a direction that's not in the client's best interest, and you're, and and there may be some discrepancy between your opinions there. Once again, I'm, for the for the live feed, I'm going to repeat this. Um, as a as a director of photography, when you're being pulled in between the director and the client, how do you handle that? <clears throat> Once again, here's call sheet, right? So up here, so the, on the call sheet, the agency is really sitting. They're the deep pockets. They're, they're basically they're hired by the client. They're hired by Taylor Made, let's say. The agency's up here. So they're the ones actually paying everybody. So the first thing he's going to is the director. And so if they're having an issue, 
I'll give you one more story, a true story. It was back when I was working with Derek Van Lynn. Like I said, here's a guy that did Alien, right? He did a middle schlock, but he also did toys. And as one of the ways I kind of got into toys when I started shooting, because I knew those clients and I kind of worked with those clients. And we're doing Barbie. And like I said earlier, Barbie is straight up fashion. That's what you're writing for. It's all about the hair. It's about the gown. If the gown has like little sparkles, you got be a visionary. Look around life. You'll see things. Like when you go into a jewelry store, you look in that case, look up inside there, and you'll see there's all kinds of little tiny tin, pinpoint lights. Why? Because every one of those things is striking it. Exactly what I don't want on this, hot spots, that's exactly what they want on jewelry. They want it to spark. So here's Barbie. She's got some nice little gown with a bunch of sparklies on it. You don't want a big flat source like that. It looks really super boring. I might use that as just general exposure, but I take a hot source, one of those little guys or whatever, and I'll rake across just so that that spark is going right through the lens. That's the money shot, right? Hey, Bart, fashion. We're on a job. Derek's directing. I'm, I'm basically his AC on thing. And we're, and it was all of a sudden, hey, they went on a crew. There's like 10 guys on the crew. And they come, they come around, agency, and they're like, you know, okay, you know, the birthday card. And you open the card, and it says, Happy birthday, Barbie. You're thinking, it's a freaking joke, right? <laughs> but you see, there's a lot of signatures already on it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I sign the card, you know, and so they, they get over to, to Derek, and they go, Can you sign the card? And Derek's like, Yeah, he's just like, No. <laughs> That's like lost your mind. She's a piece of plastic. You know, which of course to them is like, ah, oh, I think I actually heard you. You know, it's plastic. You know, she's, she's a star, you know. And this is the truth. This is like at 11 30, 12 o'clock, we have lunch at one. So he comes up to me about 15 minutes before lunch. And he goes, uh, I'm not going to be back for lunch. And I'm going, This is like, we're like, like three days to go on this project. And he's going, no, I'm not coming back. He goes, I thought, I'm, he, he had his offices in Canada. He was like, we're shooting in LA. And he goes, uh, I'll, I'm going to send down one of our other directors from the office. But he goes, no. And I remember, the agency didn't hire the other guy. They hired him. But he's ready to go to war. And he's just going, I'm tired of this video. And he's doing stuff. He has amazing stuff. Like he would take, we would like her lips on Barbie, okay? They want the lips really glossy, but they want the face kind of not plastic. So we would take a piece of just clear cellophane, and we would put it over the top of the lens. So the top part of the lens would just a little soft. Just a hair soft, but her lips are all nice and glossy. You know, stuff like that. He's like, it's fashion, right? And so this guy, he's got a cat, he walks. You know, and it's like, okay, I get this away. He walks. We're thinking he's being acid. So I come back from lunch, it's two o'clock, no Derek. 215, 230, three, no Derek. We're thinking, it's got to cool down. No, gone. So now all of a sudden, now they're really freaking out. What's going on? We're not shooting, blah, blah, blah. And he walked. He walked. This is like back in 1983, four, five. He, at that time, he took 10,000 a day as a director. He walked from at least 30 grand, because we had three days left, and said, I'm not putting up with your BS. Bye bye. So that gets back to your story. If you have an issue with the agency, I think that, once again, it's their movie. I'm going to respect the director because he's saying that's his movie. It's not my movie. It's his movie. And if they're telling him they want something different, that's their world. But <laughs> if they want you to sign a Barbie card, <laughs> sign it. You know, and take your 30 grand. That's my opinion, you know. Walk away. You know. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Gary Mansky. Uh,